All right, we have been studying, going through this book of Ephesians now for four weeks, going into the fifth week. And today we come into chapter 3, um, beginning at verse 14, the second prayer of Paul for the saints. And as we go into it, I want to bring it up right away. We're doing things slightly a little bit different here. We're going to do the Bible reading in just a moment. Um, and you'll hopefully understand why. But as we come into this portion, um, Paul begins his prayer with the statement, for this reason. For this reason. And it's really kind of neat. Uh, the word reason actually is the word kirin. And so I have it in, in the Greek there. Um, and I know that potentially some, some of you don't know it. So, but kirin, it comes from the word charis. The word charis is the word for grace. Okay? So Corinne is the accusative version of charis. I say, what does that mean? Well, it's only rarely ever used as uh, a preposition. It's a verb. It's a, it's a noun. And so, but 14 times, um, it is used as a preposition for this reason. So think about the word meaning favor or grace for a moment. Okay? It doesn't always hold true in this, but in many of them it does. Take the concept of favor. Take the concept of grace. Based upon the favor of the grace, I'm now going to tell you what I am telling you. For this reason, for this favor, because of this grace, I'm going to now declare what it is. Two of the 14 times that Paul actually um, uses this word is actually right here in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 1 actually began that way. So if you go back to verse 1 of Ephesians 3, it says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard, and so on and so forth. And we'll get to that in a moment. So he begins to talk about it as well. So what I'd like to do for our Bible readings today is I'd like to go back for the reason and begin, as we come into the prayer, to begin back in chapter 2, verse 11, okay? And, um, and we'll begin reading at ch chapter 2, verse 11, and we're going to come all the way down through chapter 3, and we're going to see... The reason. And then we're going to talk about, as Paul uses this term in parallel, first of all, to talk about how, why he was given the mystery, and then the second is why he is then bowing the knee. And today we want to talk about Paul bowing the knee to the Father, okay? So I'm going to begin reading in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, okay? If you would like to stand for the reading of the word, you may, okay? Um, but I know we're out of order on this, so, but I'm going to go ahead and read chapter 2, beginning verse 11, okay? Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ." For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. In that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which 
in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. To know, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. There's two parallelisms that I wanted to point out in this. First is that parallelism of the for this reasons. The second, real quickly, and we're not going to talk about it more other than I saw it and I thought it was kind of interesting, and that is the parallelism of Paul's prayer here to Jesus' prayer, Jesus' model prayer. If you go back in your mind, we're not going to read it, Matthew chapter 6, we can probably quote it together. Um, many people grow up Catholic or Lutheran or whatever we call it, the... Our Father. Uh, uh, uh. See, you know the Our Father. Yeah. And so, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And I think I missed, missed it. And I forgive. For, yeah, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who forg trespass against us. Anyways, but you get it, okay? But in that, and it's been a long since I've been a Lutheran. Anyway, so forget the forgiveness part. Anyways, no, don't forget the forgiveness part. But in the beginning of that, what Jesus does, okay, is he declares allegiance to the Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The second part of his prayer is presenting requests to the Father. Give us this day our daily bread. For, forgive us not our, or forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those. Lead us not into temptation. And the third part is proclaiming praise to the Father. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And so Paul uses the same basic outline. Jesus said, in, when he was talking to the disciples there in Matthew 6, he says, because they want to know how to pray, he says, in this manner, pray. In other words, don't pray this prayer, but this is the style of prayer. So I think this is kind of a little, little side note that is interesting for us to think about that there is this concept of giving allegiance to the Father in some manner, then presenting your requests, and then glorifying God for who he is. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. This is our outline, okay, as we go through it. The first thing we want to look at is Paul's allegiance. And Paul states right off this, for this reason, I bow my knees. I bow my knees. Now, the first thought process is you're thinking it's prayer, but it's not talking about prayer. It's talking about allegiance. As you come through it, and as you go through the, the usage of bowing the knee, it's always, biblically, 
referring to giving allegiance. Now, it's giving allegiance to a god, deity, a lot of times, and that may be prayer from that perspective where you're putting out a petition, but it's declaring who you believe to be superior to you. So even in the book of Genesis, when Joseph becomes second only to Pharaoh, they put him on Pharaoh's second chariot, and they run through, and they have everybody bow the knee to show allegiance now to Joseph. So we see this with Paul declares in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. He says, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory and praise of God um, the Father. That comes, that's a direct quote coming prophetically, from Isaiah 45, verse 22 and 23, where Yahweh declares, Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God in what? There is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth, in righteousness and shall not return that to me. Who, who me? God, Yahweh. That to me, Yahweh, every knee shall bow and every tongue make an oath. Who does Paul declare Jesus is? Yahweh. Yeah, it's pretty clear. Okay, So either Paul's a liar, Jesus is a liar, do you get it? You get it? Or Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. Okay, Very important thing. So Paul was saying, I bow my knee. Okay, And so in that, he's going to say, I bow my knee to the Father. Okay, But note that in here, there is this concept of the Trinity, okay, which is mind-boggling to me. We're going to see it again in his in his prayer as we go, okay. But bowing the knee is a, is a show of allegiance, okay. I know that in our culture today, there's a big battle over that kind of stuff, okay. But here's the deal. Here's the question I got to ask you: When's the last time you bowed the knee to God? Don't ask. Don't answer it. But I just want you to think about that. It's an archaic practice. Why do we do? No, wear out the knees of your pants. Get it? There's a part where of humility and submission where you come to the God of the universe. We like to say, I want to buy one in my heart. Would you want your kids to do that? Is that the kind of submission and obedience that you want your kids to do? Well, I'm obeying you inside, Dad. Okay? So just think the process through, okay? So Paul starts off with, in this form of allegiance, I'm bowing the knee. For this reason, I bow my knee to the, the Father, okay? And look what it says. He says, um, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So, I don't know about you, but it leads me to ask the question, and that is, who's the family? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, after we t read about Hebrews 11, the faith hall of fame, right? And by faith, and by faith, by faith, by faith. Chapter 12, verse 1 starts off with, Therefore, being surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, okay? It's talking about the witnesses who have what? Gone before us, okay? So the saints that are in heaven. There is this mystic sweet communion we read about, right? The church is one foundation. The mystic sweet communion of those whose rest is one, that we, we join together with the saints of the past, and we are one with them. There is one body, right? And so there is the concept of this family because we are all called by his name, which we'll get to in just a moment, okay? So we have this family, but I want you to turn with me. Well, I think I have it coming up. You can turn if you want so you can read it a little bit bigger. But in Revelation chapter 5, okay, in Revelation 5, we read about the time when the, the, the lamb has come. He is from the midst of the throne. He has taken the scroll from he was sitting on the throne, and he... And he's about ready to open up the seals. But John had been weeping because no one was found worthy. But now the, th the, the lamb takes it. And so as he takes it, worship breaks out. It just happens in heaven. And it's kind of fun because it's not delineated. It's from others. So let's read, beginning of verse 8 of Revelation 5. It says, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, those are angels, those are probably cherubim, okay? Could be seraphim, but I believe from Ezekiel they're cherubs, cherubim. Okay, they, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, those are humans. Those are probably 12 of, the, um, of Israel and 12 from the church, okay? 
We're not specifically told that, but that's what's common believed, that there are 24 elders, um, and Jesus had told the, the apostles that they would be sitting with the, um, the leaders of the tribes. So we think that those are them. The 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's us, right? And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Now stop for a moment before we go on. Okay, Who's singing? Well, it, it potentially could be the four living creatures and the 24 elders, because we're not necessarily told anything else. I think it's only going to be the 24 elders right now, because we're finding this out from the, uh, the song. Look at the song that they're singing, okay? They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. The angels weren't what? Redeemed, okay? So they redeemed us by God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So now we're getting a little bit more defined into people groups here, okay? And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. Okay, so get rid of that. So what are you talking about, Bob? Well, let's go on. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. Now it's not just the four. Now we got lots of angels. Okay? Many angels around the throne. The living creatures, those are these four guys up here, and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. Now we're told specifically that there is a what? A gathering. It's a gathering of angels and saints. This ought to make you tingle for a moment. Okay? It's a gathering of angels and saints saying... Not singing, but saying with a loud voice, Worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive powers and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. You want to sing it with me? Anyways, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb, right? And they're all singing it. Now, there's no, nothing about the redemption and everything else. They're talking about, about who God is and who the lamb is, who the incarnate God is. And there is this oneness even with angels in the saints, singing the praise of the one and only true God, declaring the praise, saying the praise, because they're not singing, they're declaring the praise of the one and only true God, who he is and what he is worthy of. And so there is this concept because it's according to the name. And so all those who go by the name are in a sense part of the same family, yes? Silas. Is Silas in here? Where's Silas? There you are, Silas. Silas, can I put you on the spot for a moment? Okay. Tell me if I get my, my datings wrong here. But if I go back 10 years ago, 10 years ago, what was your name? Yaroslav. Yaroslav. What's your name right now? What's your last name? Character. Character. What was your last name 10 years ago? Good. That's exactly right. But you were adopted. You were part of a new family. And you were given a new name. And no longer are you Yaroslav, but you're Silas. Do you track that? He's a character. Boy, is he a character. <laughs> Anyways. But he's now goes by the name character. Do you guys ever talk about that in your home? That you represent the family name? Therefore, whether you eat or drink, do all to the what? Glory. Glory of God. Eddie, what's the word mean? Reputation. reputation. The word doxa in its original means reputation. God's reputation is what? Wonderful, magnificent, glorious. That's where we get the concept from. But doxa literally means what you're known by. Your rep. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, you're doing it to the reputation of the family name. Do you track with that? You're not just reflecting on yourself, you're reflecting on your family. Whenever I led the, the, the homeschool graduations, the, when we did the, the, um, the practice and stuff, and then just before the graduation, when I had the, the se seniors in the back, I reminded them, this is your moment to stand before thousands of people and to be a testimony. At this very moment, you're going to reflect not just yourself, but you're going to reflect your family. You're going to be reflecting your mom and your dad and your entire family. And if you proclaim the name of Christ, you are reflecting even more so Jesus Christ. Because there will be many people here today who don't know him. 
but what they're going to know about him is what you all reveal. Think about that as you walk around outside. If you proclaim the name of Jesus, you are the reflection, you are the representation of what they're going to see. So, Paul says, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, specifically, in the local context, who is he talking about? The Jews and the, the Gentiles. Isn't this exciting stuff? And so, Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, another triune concept. We have this name by which we are called, but it's a name singular. And it's the name singular of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's that name? Well, it's the one we saw in Philippians chapter 2, right? In Isaiah 45, that it's the name of Yahweh. And so we all come in this one name, representing. Now, understand, they were first called Christians, right? In Antioch. So the idea is that people recognize the fact of who we seek to represent, okay? So what do they represent you as? Now, jumping into Paul's request, because this is really the meat of the message, okay? Paul says he's going to now, he's bowing the knee, and he's going to ask the Father for things on their behalf. Now, what I want you to see is that there are three um, requests, but really that are building upon one another. There are going to be three that's that are in here, okay? Um, but they're hinnas. I know that may mean nothing to you, but they're in order that's, okay? And so you're going to have, I'm going to pray that you get this, in order that you get this, in order that you get this. But there's three requests. I want this, this, and this, but I recognize the fact that they're going to what? They're going to build on one another. You've got to have this so you can get to this, so you can get to this. So ultimately, this is really what I want. But I know it's got to start here. Okay? So we're going to start with the first thing, right? The first request is that you may be strengthened in the inner man. What is the inner man? The esoanthropon. Okay? Literally, it's that guy that's inside of you. Remember, we always talk about how the, there's a war that wages inside you, and so we read about it in Romans chapter 7, okay? where Paul says in Romans 7, he says, I, For I know that it, in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to, do, to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. In other words, you guys get it, right? There's a war that's going on in me, right? Verse 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God, according to the asoanthropon, the inner man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul is referring again then to the Ephesians, like he did to the Romans, about this inner man. You guys have seen the little cartoons with the angel here and the, the, the demon here, and they're kind of whispering in the ear, and you know, and da, da, da. that's what it's like. I mean, it's a reality, okay? So again, we talked about in Sunday school how a lot of... Um, there are a lot of biblical truths that are mirrored in the world, and they use themes, okay? But there is a war inside of you. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have, we've seen from the last couple of weeks, you've been made alive. You used to be what? Dead. You didn't care about it. There was a one-sided war going on, and you were being led, okay? You walked according to the course of the world, you walked according to the prince of the power of the air, and there was no problem. But then all of a sudden... You're made alive. You have the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit is there convicting you, and so the convictions are there. But you then submit to that. You get saved. You accept Christ as your Savior. And now where's the Holy Spirit living? Where's the Holy Spirit living now? Inside of you. That's exactly right. So now you've got this war going on. Because inside of you, your physis, your very nature, right, was originally to walk in sin. 
But now you've been what? You've been changed. And there's this battle now. There's a war that's inside you. Have you guys ever felt the war? I don't want to sin. I want to sin. I don't want to sin. I want to sin. Let's be honest. I really do want to sin. But I don't want to sin. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Do you ever feel that way? I mean, you feel like literally there could be people on, on either side of you and you're the human tug of war, you know, and whichever side is what we're just going to play out at the moment. And, and sometimes you feel like you're like being dragged in the, in the mud pit in between, just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's like, oh, this wretched man that I am, this is driving me bonkers. One day you're going to go through the portal of death, praise God. Doesn't that sound awful? People say, oh, that's really warped sounding. But this mortal will put on immortality this corruptible will put on the battle's gone the battle's gone but it can be gone even today if i give more and more allegiance to this side it's not gone gone but it's much different in my life now 40 years later almost 40 years later than it was in the beginning I'm not saying it's gone it is not gone I learn for, yearn for the day when it's gone. But it does. The more and more you spend in God's word and in his presence, the more the Holy Spirit takes the lead on that. You give him that. That you may be what? Strengthened in the inner man. I am praying that you may be strengthened in the inner man. Now, how does this play out? Well, it's a gift of the Father. I'm asking the Father to grant this to you. It's something that you can't work up on your own. You can't generate it. Which means you need to be what? If it's only a gift, and you can't earn it on your own, what should you be doing? No, not just take it, but maybe even asking for it. I mean, I agree with you, uh, Michelle, that I've got, to, I've got to receive it from him because he's going to give it to me, but I want to want it. i got to want it. And if I really want something, what am I going to do? I'm going to ask for it. I mean, there's applesauce on the table. I love applesauce. And they even put cinnamon in it. Anyways, inside joke. And so, and so you give me that applesauce with a little bit of cinnamon in it, and boy, I want that, but it's on the other side of the table. So I have two options. I get up from my seat, and I go all the way around, and I grab it. You don't do that at the table. That's improper etiquette. What do you need to do? Yeah. Well, huh? <laughs> yeah, smaller you get, the you know, bigger boarding house reach. But what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to what? Ask. And so you're sitting there, and you really want it, but you don't want to what? Ask. So you never get it, because you never what? But you could have had as much of it as you wanted, if you had only asked. What do you ask for in your prayers? What do you ask the Father to give others? This is Paul. What he's asking for these believers of Ephesus. First, I want you to be strengthened in the inner man. I want the Father to grant you to be strengthened in the inner man. That strengthening, as we read then, is going to come through the Holy Spirit. He says that to be strengthened with might through his what? Spirit in the inner man. So when you got saved, back Ephesians chapter 1, when you, when you heard and you believed the word of truth, the Holy Spirit then came to dwell in you and was a guarantee and is a guarantee of your inheritance to the redemption of the purchased possession, right? So the Holy Spirit's now in you, and Jesus said he's going he's gonna to lead us into all truth, He's going to remind us of his teachings. He's going to be ministering and working within us. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, the Holy Spirit does from the inside out, if you would, is to strengthen me. If I what? Want the applesauce. You get what I'm saying? If I want it. If I want it, it's there. He's already in me if I'm his child. Stop for a moment. There's another if statement. If I'm what? His child. If you're not his child, you tracking with me? You're missing the Holy Spirit to help you with this. It's always going to be something that you're trying to endeavor on your own, and you're always going to fall short. 
But if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll have the Holy Spirit living inside you, and, and he is there to help with this process. Now, this is kind of fun, because note, note what's happening here, right? you got the gift of the who? The Father. It's going to come through the strengthening of the Spirit. But in the end, where are this, is this strengthening of the inner man going to come from? The presence of the Son. Do you note the triunity of God again? The fullness of the Godhead being applied into this, even in this prayer? It's kind of cold. You know, people say, where is the Trinity in the Bible? It is all through it. And so he goes on, he says then, that you might uh, be strengthened, that um, he would grant you according to the rich of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. It's going to come, this strengthening is going to come from the presence of the Son. Galatians 2, verse 20, Paul stated, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so it says here in Ephesians 3, Paul says, I do these things so that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Now, that word, um, uh, to dwell, katoiko, okay? I want you to pay attention. Put it in your brain. I know it's Greek, ah, whatever. But just kind of, there was a big word that started with a K, okay? And it sounded like a, a pig, pig at the end. Oink, oink, okay? Katoiko, okay? So you're going to see this word again, okay? That Christ may dwell. You say, well, what does it mean? Well, oikeo, oikos, is the word for house. It's a house. Oikeo, then, means to take up a residence. Now, it doesn't just mean remain. So the word meno means to remain. So we talked about to the word for endurance is the word hupo meno, to remain under. Okay? It's the word for, like long, not long-suffering, but to remain under, to endure. Okay? So this isn't just meaning um, kind of hanging out someplace. This literally means to take up a residence, to make it your home. Are you tracking? Okay? He could use meno if he wanted to use meno here. But he uses the word kata oikeo, okay? which means that, that Jesus is going to come and do what? Make his house in your heart. Jesus already said they'd do that to believers. He said that he and the Father would come. We focus a lot on the Holy Spirit who's coming. But Jesus said in John 14 or John 16, check, you can check me out, one, one of those two chapters, um, where he talks about, um, I think it's 14, 14, that if you love me and keep my commandments, then I and the Father will come and we'll take up the, our residence in you. Okay? So he already stated that. So it's not just the Holy Spirit who's dwelling in you, but it's Jesus who's living in you. And I submit to you, it's the Father who's living in you too. We'll see that in just one moment. This is really kind of a cool thing. Okay? That you got God living in you, okay? So, that you may be strengthened in the inner man. The second thing is that I want you to be strengthened in the inner man, okay? In order that you may be able to comprehend the love of Christ. So think about it. I want you to be able to comprehend the love of Christ. But in order for you, I don't want to lose the track of this progression, right? But in order for you to comprehend the love of Christ, you have to be what? Strengthened in the inner man. Because in yourself, as you are, you can't do it. You can't fully, you can't get it. You, you, you can't fully comprehend the love of Christ. Does anybody know the last verse? The, the last challenge, the last exhortation that Peter ever told the church. If you were in Sunday school, we read it. What's the last statement that we have recorded that Peter yearns for the church? I'll start it. You guys fill it in as we go, because you know it. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. But grow, but grow. Don't stop. Don't be where you're at right now. Continue to move. You have so much more to learn. How do you grow in grace? How much grace did you get when you got saved? Say again? All of it. So how do you grow in it, Chuck? How do you grow in something you already have all of it? You avail yourself of it? I think you become more aware of it. 
the more and more I understand how sinful and repugnant that I am, the more I realize, well, let's start this way. The more I focus on God and I realize how holy and righteous he is, the more I realize how sinful and repugnant I am, the more I realize how great his grace is. I can get so overwhelmed in the love of Christ because I have put him to the test. And he has been faithful and true. He has never left me nor forsaken me. That's why that word chesed is so important to me. It's the faithful loving kindness of God to the objects of his covenant. I have failed him more than I want to proclaim. And so Paul says, look, I want you to be strengthened in your inner man, in that inner being, because there's a battle going on. And I want you to be more and more and more and more sanctified so that you can be able to comprehend the love of Christ. What about it? First of all, it comes in the basis of it is being established on the love of Christ. So it's kind of something weird that I'm going to grow in Christ, the love of Christ, because you know the love of Christ. So it says, um, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to be comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and height to know the love of Christ. So that you, being rooted and grounded in love, will be able to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. But first, you've got to be rooted and grounded in what? Love. There's a basic part of it. You've got to be saved. You've got to get it from the first step. You, when you first got saved, I guarantee you, you don't know, you didn't know all there was about the love of God to know. But if you've grown in him, you understand that more and more and more and more and more what he's done for you. And hopefully your love for him has grown as you've appreciated more and more and more his love for you. So first of all, the basis, the rooted and grounded. I'm not going to necessarily go in there. You can go to Luke 7 or Luke 6. But this is the part where Jesus talks about the, um, the building the house upon the rock and building the house upon the sand. And what I want to show you is that word is used, this word grounded here. The word rooted literally means a root. Okay, It's that which holds the tree what? Firm in the midst of storms. Okay, But the word grounded literally is the word for foundation. It's the word for a foundation. Okay, this is the word that's used here, okay? Who dug deep and laid a foundation. It was founded on a rock. But the, the one that, the other guy who built a, a earth without a foundation, then it falls, right? You have to have a proper what? Foundation. When we were building the sun porch, okay? We, we built pillars, concrete pillars. But I didn't just put them on top of the dirt. We dug 18 to 30 inches into the ground because the freeze level here is at 12 inches, so I got to be below the freeze level, and that's where I began to build my pillars. Do you track what I'm saying? Because if I didn't do that, the undulations of the earth are still going to remove my pillars because my pillars didn't have a proper foundation. That's why a lot of houses in this area kind of, over so many years, you start to say, oh, you know, I don't feel like they're taking the time to lay a proper foundation. They want to give them up. It costs money to wait. But God's word is true. So you need to be rooted and grounded, foundation in his love. And if you don't have the foundation of his love, you ain't never going to get it. That's just being honest. You're not going to get something. And so if you have a, like, man, I don't know, I just never go there. Maybe the problem is you don't have the foundation. That's between you and God. But make sure that you have a proper foundation, okay? So it's not just, again, intellectual knowledge. It is relational knowledge, okay? So the basis, the purpose, to inwardly grasp, you know, this is my translation of this, to inwardly grasp the magnitude of Christ's love, okay? That's what's going on. 
So the word is katalambano. Again, I know I use Greek words a lot. I'm sorry, but there's so much to it. This, the word to comprehend literally is the word katalambano. It's not a thinking word. It's a seizing word. Lambano is to take or receive. Okay? Kata is according to, intensifying it. Okay? And so you are seizing. It's something that you are snatching. It's something that you're grabbing. Now, it's knowledge. So you're, it is comprehension from that point of view. But what I want you to understand, it is something that you're volitionally doing. You are grabbing this thing because you want it. You're seizing it. It's there to be seized. But you've got to be wanting to seize it. So it's the inward, inwardly grasp, seize, the magnitude of Christ's love, the width, the length, the depth, the height. Isn't this phenomenal? The width, the depth, or sorry, the width, the length, the depth, the height. I feel like I'm singing a kid's song, right? But that's it. I'm making a cube. Do you see it? I'm making a cube. This isn't two-dimensional. This is three-dimensional. This is out there. It's overflowing. In any way you can go, the love of Christ is just flowing out there. And I love this. You're going to see a little bit more of this in a moment. Paul is overflowing with superlatives throughout this entire thing. To know that which surpasses knowledge, the love of Christ. That's literally what it says. To know that which surpasses surpasses knowledge what surpasses knowledge well for us westerners nothing that's what google's all about isn't it where's my phone i can pull this up and i can use the, the thing and say google what's the the, the capital of iceland right and it's going to come back and it's going to tell me the capital of iceland google what languages do they speak in iceland Google, how would you say this in Icelander? I, well, I have Iceland on my brain, I don't know. But anyways, but you get what I'm saying, okay? That you can do all this on your phone because we are so addicted to information, to knowledge. I realized that years ago. That's really where my addiction is. My addiction is to knowledge, to information. The love of Christ is way beyond it. It's better than it. If you think having knowledge and knowing things is super cool, get to know Jesus. The love of Christ far surpasses any knowledge. So here's the deal. I'm going to bring this back to Gnosticism. It goes all the way back to our study of the book of John. Okay? So Paul is living in this concept of Gnosticism. And I've got to be careful, we've got to be careful of it, because we understand that salvation is not just knowing about God, oida, edo, okay? It's knowing God, relational. This is, talks about relational knowledge too. So be careful. Sometimes we can act Gnostic, like we have something special. We've got the special knowledge to know God. But even that is meaningless compared to understanding the love of Christ. Do you track with me? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. That's exactly right. So I'm praying that you will be strengthened in the inner man in order that you might be able to comprehend the love of Christ, in order that you may be filled track this. Don't, don't just read through this. Sometimes we just read through things and we don't think about it. That you may be filled, plerao, with all the fullness, pleroma, of God. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. All right, so we've talked about these words numerous times. Chuck, I'm putting you on the spot. Pleroma, describe it for me. Wait, 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 wait. Can you do it? Okay, can you give him the mic? Let's do it. I, I, I picked on you because I think you, you mentioned it once. That said, ah, that's good. That's right. That's exactly what it was. Yeah, good. All right, Pleroma. What's Pleroma? So Pleroma is when you fill a cup so full that if you were to add one more drop, it would spill over. 
Good. That's an so illustration. You actually, yeah, you actually get, you can actually, if you look at a glass and you fill it to Pleroma, it's actually got a dome on it of liquid. That's right. It's not flat across the top. It actually, because of the force there, it holds it in place, but a single drop more will cause it to spill over. Good, because of hydrogen bonding, it'll do that. Exactly right. Now, you understand that's Bob's illustration of Pleroma, okay? So that's good. That's exactly. Pleroma is to be filled where you can't put anything else in it. So Galatians 4, that in the pleroma of time, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be born of a virgin, to be born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. When you couldn't add one more second to the hourglass of time, Christ was born. Okay? Paul's prayer for us, for the saints. So ask yourself, what are you praying for? What do you pray for others? He ain't going weak on this thing. So that you may be filled, plerao, with all the fullness, pleroma, of God. How much of God does he want you to have? More than can be shoved in. So it's like that, that cup, it's just beaming over. It's just arcing over with hydrogen bonding. You get what I'm saying, where I'm going? Okay, now, this is, gets fun. And Brian, I loved your, your devotional today because you, 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 you're just prepping everybody because we're going to go into Colossians here. All right, Colossians, verse, chapter 1, verse 15, about Jesus. Jesus is called, we're called, the, he's called the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of overall creation. The word that's important here, though, I bring it up, is the word for image, is the word icon, okay? Now, there are a bunch of words in Greek for form, but an icon is an icon, no, no, it's an icon, okay? So somebody, what's an icon? If, if I said to you, iconoclasm, the worship of icons, whatever, what's an icon? It's an idol, it's a, a statue. Oh, you're, but you're doing representation, but it's simply, it's a what? It's a statue, it's a statue. And so Justin's not, did Justin stay in there? No, he walked out. Uh, normally is where I pick on Justin because Justin is, is good with um, sculpting, yeah, with clay and stuff like that. But when, if he was here, he'd tell you, when, when, if you make one of those icons, it's hollow on the inside. It's not solid, because it would explode in the kiln, because you'd have the air bubbles and stuff like that. That's why they're hollow on the inside. So back in, in, in the olden days, okay, in the days of Abraham and stuff like that, with the icons, when they worshipped idols, they would stuff those icons with herbs and stuff like that. Okay, and, and, and they would be uh, the blessings of the, of the gods upon them, and, and so for the... the the sex ones that they would have, the aphrodisiacs, I think is what you call those things, right? Anyways, up inside there and all that kind of stuff, and yada, yada, yada. So think what's going to get ready to be happen. Jesus is the icon of the invisible God. He is the physical representation of what you can see. Because no man is what? Seen Seeing God, okay? Verse 19, chapter 1, verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, that's Christ, all the fullness, pleroma, should dwell, kata oikeo. All the fullness of God was going to be in the icon that we refer to as Jesus. You tracking with me? God became what? Flesh and what? Dwelled among us. No man has seen God at any time. But if you want to see what God would act like if God was on the earth, who do you look at? Jesus. But when you looked at Jesus, he was marred, and he was, there was nothing that would draw us to him, we're told in Isaiah 53, right? Because that being that we saw wasn't him himself. That was just his icon. That was just his tent. That was just his flesh. Stuffed inside that flesh was the fullness of, of God bodily. Can you imagine that? I can't comprehend that. That's why when Jesus was on the earth, God was present on the earth, not just part of God. All of God. It pleased the Father that all the fullness should dwell in him bodily. And so I, I want to talk about the dwell. Kata oikeo. It was housed in Jesus. The fullness of God was housed in Jesus. Colossians 2, for in him dwells, kata oikeo, all the fullness, pleroma, of the Godhead bodily. And you are plerao in him 
who is the head over all principalities and power. So Paul is praying that we would be filled, plerao, with all the pleroma of God. And we're already told that Jesus, part of his prayer is that Jesus would what? Come and kata, kata oiketo inside you. So if the fullness of God is kata oiketo inside of Jesus, so the pleroma of God is kata oiketoing inside Jesus, and Jesus is kata oiketo, Kata oikeko, <laughs> echoing, whatever the word is, inside of you. You get where I'm going, right? Where's the fullness of God? Inside of you. Paul is praying that you can be strengthened in the inner man so that Christ will come and dwell in you so that you can comprehend the love of Christ so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. That ought to blow your socks off. And you ought to be saying to yourself right off the bat, that is totally impossible. That's nuts. I'm, I mean, I'm Bob. I'm, I know who, I mean, and we're talking, the holy, righteous, omnipotent God dwelling inside, and there's no way. It's because I'm focusing on Bob. And I don't think it's without um, wonder that Paul transitions in this next part of his prayer then to this doxology. Because when I meditate upon the power of God, it's going to lead me to this praise of God. And so what does he start off with when he's talking about the power of God? This is Bob's literal translation, okay? So this is Bob's. To him who is explosively able over all things to perform over superabundantly those things which we ask or think according to the explosive ability which is working in us. It's the word dunamis. <laughs> means to be able. But we understand it, the explosive part of it. In other words, you are able to do it. You have the power to do things. And God has what? The power. He's explosively able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. But those words exceeding abundantly are even better in Greek. It's just over super abundantly. Over super abundantly. It sounds like a word that Gabrielle would be coming up with. I don't know where Gabrielle's right now. That God is able, he's able to do over super abundantly above all that you can even think. That's what I always tell people. When you get to heaven, when you talk about heaven and people want to talk about heaven and what heaven's like, dude, if you can think about it, it's better than that. I mean, we shortchange God on a lot of things. There is no way, no way that this God can dwell inside me. Really? He came to the earth, and the fullness of God was dwelt bodily. He walked the earth. He made the great exchange of your sin for his righteousness. And you're saying he can't do what he's declared he's going to do? He can transform you from the inside out. All you got to do is what? Want it. Submit to it. Yearn for it. Hebrews 11, verse 6. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For those who come to him must believe that he exists, the song of God, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I believe him. I believe that that's why he called me. That's why he predestined me to be conformed to the image of his son. I believe what he meant when he said that he who began the good work in me will continue to perform until the day of Christ. Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. I want to be open. I want to be filleted open. I want to, and I don't, I don't want to be humiliated. But if it's what it takes, do you track? I remember years ago when God put me out of the ministry for a while and put me on the, and we were planting this church. And I felt like I was put on the shelf for many years. That was hard, but I was okay with it because God was teaching me lessons through it. 
He was humbling me. He was chastening me. He was loving me. And I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. If you really want to grow and understand the, the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of God, the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, you got to want it. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. And he is able then to do super abundantly above all that you could ever ask. The word there could also mean beg or think. According to what, though? According to the explosive power that's already what? Working in you. If you know Christ is your Savior, if you know Christ, there's already been a miracle of miracles, a supernatural explosion <laughs> that happened in you. And that same explosive power that he's already been working in you, he wants us to continue to do it. Why do we live like dead men? Do you get the progression of this whole book so far? Next week, we're going to start in chapter 4. The application of walking worthy. Therefore, I beseech you, brethren. Therefore, I, Paul, therefore, I, oh, I'm going to mess it up. Therefore, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Based upon all these things, now I'm going to challenge you. Walk in it. If you don't want to hear these messages, don't come for the next month and a half. Anyways, because that's what the next month and a half is going to be all about. Walking in it. Walking in it. But meditating on the power of God then leads to the glory of God. Where? That God would be glorified in the church. God should be being glorified <laughs> in the church. If he ain't getting glorified in the church, why do we expect him to be glorified elsewhere? To the extent, to all generations, and to all eons. Forever and ever and ever and ever in the church. All generations. So, do you pray for the others in this body of believers? I mean, honestly, do you pray? Don't put up your hand. Don't tell me. Just ask yourself the question. Are you praying for the others? You ought to. If you're not, shame on you. Shame on me. When we don't do what God's called us to do. If you are, what are you praying? For what do you pray? Are we praying in the spirit for spiritual growth and understanding? Or are we praying in the flesh? Only worrying about earthly things. Are we praying that we might be filled with the fullness of God? Think about it. That's the end of it, right? It's the end game. Is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? I have this one. So before I pray, I want us to apply it. And I want us to close with the doxology. In your hymnal, it has, I, did, I forgot to change from last week. So you've been surprised. So, so a cappella, the doxology. Ready? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you. You alone are God. There is no other God but you. And you have revealed yourself to us. We didn't, we didn't come up with this. You did. And I just so rejoice in you for what you have done. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this prayer of Paul. Lord, help us to magnify you. Help us to yearn to know you deeper every day, to, to know the fullness of the love of Christ and to be filled with the fullness of you. I don't know how that looks on the earth, but I just thank you, Lord, that you are continually transforming me every single day. I yearn to look like you. I yearn to reflect you. I yearn for others to see you 
and not me. And I pray for that for this assembly as well, Lord, that you would help us as an assembly to grow in your grace and knowledge, that we would be strengthened, each one in the inner man, but that we would be strengthened as, a, as an assembly in the inner man, according to the working of your spirit that works in us. Lord, that we might dwell, take up residence in Christ and he in us. That his love, your love, would be revealed in us, to us, through us. Again, that you receive the glory in Christ's name. Amen.